close to Mickey and Dickie, and we said to them from the beginning, you know, we're going to get this movie made. You guys are going to get to see yourselves up there on the on the big screen. I'm not sure how happy Dickie was first time he saw it, but <laughs> but uh, no, it was all really about just believing in that story. Aaron, I remember Wired Magazine had like an open letter to you and Fincher making fun of, of Facebook movies and social network at the time. <laughs> what was it like to sit down and write that every day with such negativity? I didn't know about that. Uh, <laughs> It, it was online. It was not a friend. Uh, uh, there's no question that uh, 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 you know it, it was announced that uh, uh, that Fincher and I were doing a movie about Facebook, and that's all that was known about it. And it was put that way, um, and it, it was met with a collective look uh, uh, like that. Um, uh, but people were imagining a different movie than than the one that that we were doing, and uh, I knew we weren't making the movie about Facebook. Uh, so, um, so, so that didn't bother me that much. Uh, you know, I think that the thing that all of the movies up here, represented up here on stage, have in common is that the only thing that they have going for them is that they're good. Uh, e even Toy Story 3, uh, which was pretty much guaranteed to be a commercial success because of the brand, um, uh, you know, I, I feel like Michael, uh, uh, you sort of get him should get an automatic Oscar uh, uh, because uh, it, it was the best reviewed movie of the year. Uh, uh, you know, um, uh, to anticipate that, if, <laughs> um, uh, that it would be that kind of uh, artistic success is, is just stunning. Um, and, and with the rest of the movies, you know, all, all, all you can really hang your hat on is this movie is good um, and studios behind those movies saying this movie is good so you should go see it. Speak up just a little, thing for movies. Speak up just a little, Aaron. Just one, one last thing. Was it tough for you to write with all that negativity? Uh, no, I, I, you know what? No one. I, I, I put more pressure on myself okay. than, than outside forces. So it's, I'm not, I'm not usually going to be hearing it. I was eager for the movie to come out so that people could see that. At the very least, it's, this isn't what the movie is about. What right. you think it is, it's not people falling in love on the internet or <laughs> poking each other. <laughs> David. I think Aaron's actually atypically being way too modest. Uh, <laughs> because uh, he, he, has, he, he did something which is very difficult to do, and that is to write a movie with an anti-hero as your leading role. And try pulling that off, folks. It ain't easy, so uh, you're being much, much too modest. <laughs> In the case of the King's Speech, when I told my manager that I was going to write a story about a stuttering king, he said, fine, I have no idea what to do with it. Don't even show it to me. <laughs> uh, Is he you know, still your manager? Yeah, he's still my manager. Right. Too, yeah. uh, you know, but I had to write it. I had said that I would uh, to my childhood hero, and I had waited so many years to do it. I wasn't going to not do it. And it was, because I wrote it when I uh, uh, was very ill at the time, it, it was kind of a last will and testament. So, yeah, I just, it was a personal piece I had to write, and so I wrote it. Sometimes you write a script and you go, God, I just want to see that movie. And, you just, and that repels you. You want to see that movie. And uh, so that was, that was the case for me. Michael, ton of pressure. Yeah, I mean, it couldn't. Uh, you know, the, the good news about Toy Story 3 was you knew it was getting made, but so the bad news was you knew it was going to get made. And I remember after after getting hired, I went and I said, oh, I wonder how the uh, other films were received. And I go look at Rotten Tomatoes, and the first Toy Story is like 90 positive reviews, zero negative reviews, 100%. And the second Toy Story movie is 140 positive reviews, zero negative reviews. So it's just like, I know, exactly. So now I'm like, okay, you know, like, this has to be perfect. Like, if, if it's less than perfect, it's just going to be a letdown to anyone. And then, so so we already felt pressure, and I remember right after the film was released, the director, Leon Grich, got a, someone somehow got his, uh, his uh, number at Pixar and called him up and left a message on the voicemail, and it was like, Lee, I know you're directing Toy Story, don't screw it up, alright, don't fuck it up, this is really important. <laughs> and so, 
Lee played this uh, message back to me, and it's just like, you realize that there's a whole generation of people out there who've grown up with the other two films, and, if, and I'm like the new guy in the project, so if, if the third one doesn't turn out well, everyone is going to blame me. So that really, like, your stomach kind of goes cold when you have that kind of realization, <laughs> because you go, Jesus Christ, and they're spending a gazillion dollars to make this, and, you know, I'm sitting there alone in my office, like, trying to make this thing work. But the thing is, I'll 100% agree with with um, Stuart, sorry, which is that it's just you. At a certain point, you have to shut the door to the world and go, okay, what movie do I want to see? Like, what's going to be fun? What's going to be funny? What What do I want to see? And I remember my goal at the beginning of Toy Story 3 was I want to make it funny, like really funny, and I want to make it weird. You know, I want to make it really weird and strange because the danger in in these kind of films is sort of bland cuteness. You know, and so the fact that we have this sort of lumbering big baby and you know Buzz starts speaking Spanish and like all that weird stuff, it's just like I feel like you know, and then people like it. Yeah. So you know, I but I made like we were. I was writing for myself. Like, I just was writing for what I wanted to see up on screen. Mr. Potato Head becoming Mr. Tortilla <laughs> kind of deal. Uh, <laughs> awesome. Um, well, so, you know, some people from the outside look and they say screenwriting is easy. You need a beginning, a middle, and an end. And just fill in the blanks in between each of those. Here's what's great. Each of your films has a fantastic first act, second act, and third act. And I want to talk about what makes them distinctive. Michael, starting with you and then coming back down the line, just for the, for the opening, and you've talked a lot about great beginnings, you have a lot to set up in the first act. People know your characters because of the previous two movies. You're dealing with exposition issues of the daycare center, and you open on this fantastical playtime tangent. That the you, the you hardest know, talk thing about was your starting point. Yeah, the hardest, and I feel like uh, beginnings are really interesting because I think your film is always heading towards an ending, like it's sort of preordained, but you can choose whatever you want for your beginning. So it's like, as a writer, it's your freest time. And the problem, we had a lot of problems just introducing these characters, all this exposition, character exposition, relationship exposition, et cetera. The, the, the solution that we ended up falling on was just jumping to a bunch of different realities where you open up in Andy's imagination and then you've got to pop out of that and go into Andy's bedroom when he's eight years old. And then we had to figure out how to make a transition to, you know, ten years later. So then we popped into the the handheld camcorder point of view, so you're into, and that way you're able to do a bunch of jump cuts and get through sort of the golden age of, of Andy and his toys, and then you pop into back to Andy's room, the toys in the in the toy chest, you know, waiting for Andy to come in, and that's, you know, just because you're, you're doing, in eight pages, you're, you're going into four different realities, you know, and having the audience sort of weave their way through that to get to the point where, you know, the toys are waiting for Andy to play with them and he doesn't play with them. It was really hard. It took about two years to figure out, like, that chronology of, of different uh, sequences. From the opening of your film, and then we find out, no, he's going to be outside in front of a whole crowd of people looking right at him, having probably one of the worst speaking experiences of his life that pulls the rug out from people. Talk about your opening, and as I remember, you actually had another opening just, just like the Winter's Bone Ladies. That you yes, I had a totally different opening, and my director scotched it. Uh, <laughs> for some valid reasons. Uh,